Chapter Twelve of It's Your Fairy Tale, you know, by Elizabeth Rhodes Jackson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Blind Man's Buff with the Giant. The pixie dropped in as usual after supper and tried to act as if nothing had happened. But he can't get away with that, said Wendell to himself. Hello, old sport, said the pixie in an offhand way. How are the fractions? Oh, they're all there, returned Wendell. But I say, what do you mean by sneaking off and leaving me this afternoon? I'd like to know that. I didn't sneak, said the pixie indignantly. I mentioned that I was going. I never sneak. I'd like to know what you call it, then. You didn't wait for me, did you? Oh, said the pixie. Why, I'm awfully sorry, old chap. I thought you weren't ready to come home when I left. Why didn't you wait till I was, then? Why, that would have seemed so like hurrying you, explained the pixie gently. No one can do a really artistic job with that being waited for feeling. By the way, did you make any headway? Get any line on the cloak? Yes, I got it all right, said Wendell, but you might have waited to see. I hope I didn't seem rude, said the pixie penitently. Really, to be frank, I never did take much interest in the second-hand clothing trade. Perhaps I made it too evident that I was a bit bored. I'll wait for you next time. You can take it from me there won't be any next time, returned Wendell, in a rude voice that was a sad contrast to the pixie's gentlemanly manner. I'm going alone tomorrow. I guess the cloak of darkness will be worth several dozens of your old transformations. So there. I'm sure you will regret this hasty expression of feeling when you take time to think it over, my dear young friend, said the pixie, gravely yet kindly. I think I would better leave you until you come to your better self. He instantly vanished from sight. A few minutes later he put his head in at the door and said in a forgiving tone, There are your fractions, and shut the door again. Wendell felt much aggrieved. He knew that the pixie had treated him badly, and was now trying to make it appear that he was at fault, and he resolved that he would really go all alone for the cap of thought, and rely entirely upon the cloak of darkness for his success. So after school the next day he rolled the cloak of darkness under his arm, made sure that he had enough money for car fare in his pockets this time, and took the car at Park Street for Brookline. After he got off the car, Wendell adjusted the cloak of darkness and walked on with entire assurance and a high spirit of adventure to the giant's house. He went up the neat brick steps and tried the front door with great caution, but it did not yield. Then he went around to the back door, and that was much better, for the door was open, and he walked straight in, and found the cruel stepmother and the ugly stepsister getting dinner in the kitchen. "'These grapes aren't very good, Mummer,' remarked the young lady. "'Not nearly so good as the ones last week.' "'Naturally,' returned the witch, somewhat grimly, "'I had to pay for these.' "'Oh, of course,' said her daughter. "'You didn't have your cloak of darkness when you went marketing today.' And the high cost of living is something awful when the market man can see you every minute and you can't take a thing without paying for it, complained her mother. If I don't find that cloak soon, I just hope the government will get after those dishonest profiteers. Mummer, said her daughter thoughtfully after a moment. Well, wasn't your cloak in the bathroom closet? Yes, but I've hunted all through and I'm sure it isn't there. But, Mummer, I hate to think of it, but those plumbers yesterday. The witch gasped and sat down heavily. My word, you're right. That's just where it's gone. And the cap of thought, was that with it? No, I'm glad to say. That's in my bottom bureau drawer. Wendell waited for no more. He tiptoed out and ran lightly upstairs. Now which room was it? This front one, of course. He opened the lowest drawer of the bureau. Yes, there it lay, a little filmy cap of indescribable color. The front door banged suddenly. Wendell picked up the cap and tiptoed into the hall and looked over the banisters. Ah, but he was thankful then for the cloak of darkness, for there stood the giant. And while Wendell watched him, fascinated and secure, 
The giant's huge nose began to twitch like a rabbit's. He sniffed and then roared out, fee fi fo fum i smell the blood no i won't be quiet of an englishman be he alive well your cook's gone isn't she she can't be any goner or be he dead i'll grind his bones hold on it smells just like that boy that was here yesterday where is he he bellowed out the question this roused tremendous excitement in the family both women talked at once the little wretch Positive he stole my cloak. Got away invisible. Shan't get away this time. Lock the doors, mummer. But we can't see him. I'll soon sniff him out. This last from the giant. Wendell stood transfixed at the head of the stairs, clutching the cap. Did he dare descend? No, for the giant growled out, He's upstairs all right, and started up the flight. Wendell fled before him and turned back into the front bedroom, the giant sniffing close at his heels. There was an open window in the room, but Wendell dared not risk a jump from the second story. There ran rapidly through his mind all the expedients that he could remember, from his reading of wild animal books, for throwing the hunter off the trail of the quarry. If he could double on his track, but the track was too short. If he could climb to a height and break the scent by leaping off. But the chiffonier was the highest thing in sight. If he could follow a stream of running water. He wondered whether there was anything to gain by making a dash for the bathroom. The giant had adopted a horribly sure method. Crouching at the height of a boy, with hands outstretched to touch the wall on either side, he advanced slowly across the room. Wendell stood at bay in a corner, helpless, desperate, but still game. Just then the telephone rang. The giant paused to say, If that's for me, I can't be bothered now. Take the number and say I'll call him later. And that one moment of interruption gave Wendell a chance to duck under the mighty monster's arm and seek refuge in the other corner behind his back. But he knew that his respite was but momentary. Although the ugly stepsister had gone to answer the telephone, the witch still blocked the door, and as the giant reached the other wall fruitlessly, he sniffed intently and once more started across the room. Wendell felt sure that he stood face to face with his last moment of life. He jammed the cap on his head to leave both hands free, drew out and opened his jackknife, and prepared to sell his life dearly. End of chapter 12「Chapter Thirteen of It's Your Fairy Tale, You Know, by Elizabeth Rhodes Jackson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Cap of Thought Almost drowned by the continuous bellow of the giant, and yet coming distinctly to his consciousness, he seemed to hear, or rather feel, a low, monotonous voice that bore a resemblance to the giant's speaking tone, and yet had no quality of roar about it. I must shut that window. If he should jump out of that to the porch roof, he could easily climb down the trellis. It was the giant thinking. Wendell took a chance and jumped for the window, just in time. As he landed on the porch roof, the window was slammed behind him. He went backwards down the trellis, and just before his eyes dropped below the level, he saw the giant pass the window again, pursuing the scent which doubtless still lingered. Spent and breathless though he was, fright urged the boy on, and he ran two blocks, then dropped under a tree in a garden, and lay at full length on his back with the cloak around him. He lay there a long while, slowly recovering from his terrible exhaustion, and gradually getting his nerve back. At length he rose, took off and folded his cloak, put on his cloth cap, which he had stuffed into his pocket on entering the giant's house, and walked on to the electric car. He had quite forgotten the cap of thought, which he was still wearing under his own cap, and that single fact shows how dazed the encounter with the giant had left him. But as soon as he got on the car, he was reminded of the cap by the babble of thoughts that greeted him. 
The undercurrent was a low, expressionless hum blending indistinctly from minds intent upon the newspapers, but other thoughts reached him clearly and stridently. If the stores aren't closed, I'll try to get some of that blue denim for Jackie's overalls. If he does ask me to the next dance, I really think I ought to have a new pink Georgette. I can't account for that dollar. Let me see. Fifteen cents for the cigar, seventeen cents for the soda. That leaves sixty-eight and five. Above them all, one insistent thought reiterated savagely. If he calls me that again, I'll show him where he gets off. Wendell was very anxious to examine the cap of thought more closely. The brief time that he had held it in his hands in the giant's house had been so crowded with other impressions that he had but an indistinct conception of his new treasure. He went straight to his room and took it off and was delighted with its beauty. At first sight it seemed to be made of grey cobwebs closely woven together into an almost colourless fabric but in certain lights it looked as if woven of strands of glass in rainbow colours. As there was no one upstairs to try its magic properties on, Wendell decided to wear it in the library after dinner, and find out what his family was thinking about. He noticed in the glass with great satisfaction that the cap took on the colour of his own brown hair, so that it was barely visible. There was a pleasant group in the library when he joined them after dinner. They were all very quiet. His mother was darning stockings, his father reading the transcript and occasionally reading some item aloud, and his Latin school brother playing checkers with cousin Virginia. Yet the room was filled to Wendell's sensitive consciousness with a fine hum, as of conversation. He sat down quietly behind his mother, who had not heard him come in. And then she went on thinking, he will step down from the stage with everyone applauding wildly and saying, Yes, that's the one. That's Wendell Cabot Bradford, the prize orator, the greatest public speaker Harvard has ever produced. Turning, she saw Wendell, gave him a loving smile, and wondered why he looked so red and uncomfortable. He tried his father next and was greatly interested to hear two trains of thought going on in his mind at once one on the widening of State Street, the subject discussed in the editorial that he was reading, and the other apparently a memory of a telephone conversation he had held that afternoon with the headmaster of Wendell's school. He seemed to be turning over in his mind while he read the editorial the best method of introducing the subject under discussion into a conversation with Wendell and as the subject under discussion had been the very painful one of Wendell's low standing, Wendell decided to go to bed at once. He paused long enough to learn that his brother Otis's thought had nothing to do with checkers, but was idly resting on a dimple in the cheek of a Dedham girl named Dorothy, whom Wendell had never heard of, but he treasured the name in memory for future diplomatic use, and that cousin Virginia was thinking, Oh, to be in New York now, the toddles there, Boston, checkers, baked beans, anticamassers, silhouettes, pantalettes, I shall die. The telephone rang. Wendell offered to go, as he was just starting for bed anyway. It proved to be someone asking for him. Do you know who this is? asked an eager girlish voice. Can't you guess? It's the beauteous maiden. I knew you would want to hear from me, but I had such a time finding you. I didn't know how you were listed. Yes, I'm getting on beautifully. Oh, yes, the contract is signed. We did it that day. The president of the producing company is delighted with me. He says I shall film beautifully. He says my youth, innocence, and beauty will make me the most popular girl in America. How are you progressing with the invisible cloak? You have? How perfectly splendid! and the cap of you have how perfectly wonderful and the book no i don't know where she keeps it i never saw it but she always keeps the attic locked and never let me up there so that might be oh let me give you my phone number you must let me know of course how it comes out wendell wrote it down but there was a queer sinking in the place where he kept his heart or his stomach he didn't know which he was remembering the kobold's remark about marrying the beauteous maiden. 
Whenever he thought of it, he was attacked by that same curious sinking. What a brainless fellow that Kobold was, to be sure, just as the Pixie had said. He rather wished he hadn't been so short with the Pixie last night. He was a well-meaning chap, after all, and a fiend at fractions. When he got upstairs to his room, there was the Pixie waiting for him, and Wendell was really very glad to see him, and decided not to reopen the subject of the Pixie's precipitate flight from the giant's house. The Pixie was tremendously interested in the cap of thought. He tried it on, and also the cloak of darkness, and had Wendell try them both on to show how they worked and the pixie gave some very kind advice as to getting possession of the magic book, and offered to work some of his best transformation spells, but Wendell had his plan all made and laid it before the pixie. It was to go out very early Saturday morning, when he would have a holiday from school, watch the house till the giant had left, and thus have the whole day ahead of him to search the premises. He relied on the magic cloak and cap to help him out of any difficulties that might arise. Well, perhaps that's the best plan, assented the pixie, and of course, if you find it necessary, you can count on me to change you into anything we think most useful. For instance, you might like to be changed to a moving truck if this magic book is like any other magic books I've ever seen. How do you mean? said Wendell. Well, the subject matter is pretty heavy, you know. It makes the book rather weighty. Oh, does it, said Wendell. I didn't know. And another thing I want to warn you of, said the pixie seriously. Don't read any charm aloud till you know what it's for. They ought to make those magic books foolproof, but they don't. I'll remember, said Wendell. End of chapter 13「Chapter Fourteen of It's Your Fairy Tale, You Know by Elizabeth Rhodes Jackson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Magic Book Wendell had counted on having a good deal of support with the cloak of darkness and the cap of thought, wearing them around the house and outdoors and even in school, but he was a bit afraid to risk any accident to them before the eventful Saturday so he locked them securely in a chiffonier until that morning. It was usually very hard to get him to wake up Saturday mornings, but this Saturday was an exception. He was up with the lark, if there had been any, ate his breakfast before the rest of the family came down, and was soon on his way over the now familiar route to the Brookline house. He had timed it nicely. The giant was just leaving as he got there, and Wendell, only too aware that his scent was now well known to the giant, scuttled down a side street until the monster was out of sight. Into the familiar kitchen once more, and all through the house, went Wendell. The mother and daughter were doing the upstairs work, and Wendell sat around with them for some time, following a confusion of most uninteresting household details that ran through their minds. At length he was repaid. I guess I'll get my warm quilt out for the winter, thought the girl. It's getting cold these nights. Now where did Mummer put that attic key? If I ask her, she probably won't tell me. Just to be mean, I'll hunt around instead. Presently the witch went downstairs, and her daughter took that opportunity to look through her mother's bureau drawers, and after some search she found it. I'd better wait, she thought, till Mummer goes marketing. Then I'll put the key back again and say nothing about it. But she had no sooner gone downstairs herself than Wendell took the key and unlocked the attic door. He took the precaution of locking it again on the inside so that there could be no intrusion while he was searching for the book. He chuckled to think how chagrined the ugly stepsister would be when she went to look for the key and thought her mother had changed its hiding place. The attic was a large unfinished room with peaked roof. It was only in the middle that one could stand upright. There was some old furniture and there were several trunks. Wendell tried the trunks first. One was locked with the key still in the lock and opened easily. 
and there inside, among a store of pillowcases and towels, lay what was undoubtedly the magic book. It was as easy as that. The book was about as large as Webster's unabridged. It was bound in very dark, smooth leather, all worn and frayed at the corners, and fastened with a heavy iron clasp. It did look heavy, just as the pixie had said, but Wendell seized it firmly and attempted to lift it with an energy that almost pulled his arms from their sockets. For the book didn't lift a fraction of an inch. It might have been soldered to the trunk. My, it is weighty. He was right, gasped the boy. He tried again and again, but the book must have weighed tons. There was no lifting it. Wendell considered the matter. There must be something he could do, but what? Of course, he could go home and tell the pixie and get changed into something strong, a yoke of oxen or an elephant. But this was Saturday. The pixie had done Monday's fractions Friday night and probably wouldn't be around again till Monday night. Well, well, what a disappointment. He sat down on the edge of the trunk and examined the volume. There was no title on the cover. He undid the clasp and opened the book at random. Yes, this was undoubtedly it. The quaint old lettering showed it, the long, strange words. He spelled out what seemed a perfectly meaningless sentence. Whisht! A prolonged rushing noise like a skyrocket, and there stood before him a strange and uncouth figure. It was a man somewhat above average height, wearing a costume that Wendell thought was oriental, though he had never seen anything like it before. "'Who are you?' faltered Wendell. "'I am the slave of the charm,' replied the stranger. "'I have answered your summons. What are your commands?' "'I don't quite understand,' gasped Wendell. "'Please explain.' "'You said the magic words that summon me,' repeated the apparition. "'I am here to do your bidding.' "'Oh, I see,' said Wendell. "'Good work. Please take this book home for me.' "'I obey,' returned the stranger. He lifted the book on his shoulder, turned down the stairs, and vanished straight through the locked door. Wendell scrambled after him, first drawing around him the cloak of darkness which he had thrown off. Not being a magic apparition himself, he was forced to unlock the door to get through, and this delayed him a moment. So he caught just a glimpse of the genie, vanishing through the front door without opening it. But the witch and her daughter had seen him go, and seen the book on his shoulder, and the daughter's mind was whirling like a merry-go-round, as Wendell easily perceived. However, it was quite otherwise with her mother. The former witch sat on the lowest step of the stairs, with such a happy and peaceful look that Wendell hardly knew her. Free at last, she was exulting inwardly. I have lost the cloak and the cap and now the book, and at last I am disenchanted. Wendell was glad she felt so good about it. He stayed invisible, nevertheless, and hurried out after his slave, who was now nowhere in sight. His trail could be followed, however, by a long line of small boys, stringing out after him as if they were running to a fire. As it seemed impossible to overtake him on foot, Wendell took an electric for home. Evidently his slave was there before him, to judge from the excitement that still reigned among the boys on his block. "'Say, Wendell,' they hailed him, "'you ought to have seen the guy that just went into your house.' Wendell found the front door intact and went up to his room. There on his study table lay the book. The slave had vanished. Wendell's first impulse was to read it from cover to cover, but he was mindful of the pixie's warning. He had already had one demonstration— of the wonderful power and immediate operation of its charms. This once it had turned out very neatly for him, but he might not be so fortunate another time. So he opened the book very gingerly and pressed his lips tight together, for fear of being betrayed by his intense interest into reading some powerful and dangerous passage aloud. The first thing that Wendell noticed was that it was all written or printed by hand, and was evidently the work of different persons, that is, the letters, some in print, some in script, changed their character from page to page, and the ink was in varying degrees of paleness, 
as if the transcription had been made at different epochs. Wendell observed also that the pages of paper differed. In fact, some of them were not paper at all. There were pages of very thin leather of different shades and a sort of tough fibrous substance. That was parchment, had Wendell known it, and some strips of bark, like bark of the birch or ash. And there were paper leaves also, but yellowed and old, none of it modern. The book was evidently a bound collection of old manuscripts brought together from what sources, by what means, and through how many ages, the boy could not even guess. But it was a fascinating thing for magic-loving Wendell to examine, even though much of it was unintelligible, and much more of no possible use to Wendell. He turned the brittle, fragile pages with the utmost care, fingering each at the right-hand top corner, and turning the entire page with his flat hand, very, very carefully. The titles of the chapters, or charms, or whatever they were, delighted him beyond measure. How to turn wood into silver. How to turn base metals into gold. How to make iron float. To change an infant prince into a hummingbird. To cut off a dragon's head. How to understand the language of birds. How to make a flying ship. Ha! Huh, magic aviation, commented Wendell. The easiest way to disenchant a dumb princess. How to make winged sandals. Some tried methods for killing giants. There you are, Wendell, my boy, said a friendly voice, and Wendell looked around and found that the pixie was looking over his shoulder at the book. End of chapter 14 End of It's Your Fairy Tale You Know by Elizabeth Rhodes Jackson Chapter 15 of It's Your Fairy Tale You Know by Elizabeth Rhodes Jackson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Choice of Charms. Hello, old sport, said Wendell. I didn't expect you till Monday. Oh, I just dropped in, said the pixie. Great book, isn't it? But go easy, son, go easy. Danger, you know. Yes, I am going easy, said Wendell. I haven't read one word out loud. It's some book, though. Let's read that thing about giants, suggested the pixie. That ought to just suit your case. I suppose there's no harm in reading this aloud, said Wendell, hesitatingly. Just sort of directions, you see. Go slowly, commanded the pixie, and if you see any charm coming to meet you, stop short. Wendell read, Some Tried Methods for Killing Giants. Method ye first to kill a giant. Put salt on his tail, interpolated the pixie. Please listen, said Wendell, and went on. Dig a hole deeper than his height a few steps from his door. Cover it with branches of trees. Standing on the further side away from his house, taunt him in a loud voice. When he rushes out, he will fall into the hole and can be easily dispatched. "'By whom?' inquired the pixie, after deep thought. "'I vote not by me.' "'Well, here's another,' said Wendell. "'Method ye second. "'Assume the disguise of a wayworn traveller. "'Knock at the giant's door and ask for a night's lodging.' "'I can't do that,' said Wendell. "'He knows me by smell.' "'Never mind. Read it through,' said the pixie. "'He will tell you that he has no extra bed, "'but that you are welcome to share his son's.' "'Yes, but he hasn't a son,' said Wendell. "'Never mind, it's interesting. Go on,' said the pixie. "'When you go to bed, he will put a gold chain around his son's neck "'and a hempen rope round your neck. "'As soon as he has left you, put the hempen rope round his son's neck "'and the gold chain round your own neck, and then feign sleep. "'After a time, the giant will return. "'He will feel for the gold chain, and finding it on your neck, and the hempen rope on his son's neck, he will cut off his son's head with his sword. You must then wait until you hear the giant's snores, and rising quickly, taking care, suggested the pixie, not to step on a tack, make your way to his bedside and lop off his head with his own sword. Too much shortening in that recipe, said the pixie. Try another. 
Giant killing as recommended by Puss in Boots, read Wendell. Invite the giant to a feast at your castle, and after he is in a good humor, make a wager that you can change yourself into an animal more quickly than he can. Change yourself into a cat, and whatever form the giant assumes, whether that of a lion, tiger, leopard, or what not, let the onlookers declare that the contest is a draw, and that the trial must be made again. Convince the giant that in order to ensure a perfectly fair trial, both contestants should change to the same shape, and choose that of a mouse. At the word, allow the giant to take the shape of a mouse, while you retain that of a cat, and immediately devour him. That sounds rather good, said the pixie approvingly. You'd have to practice your transformations at home first, of course, and be sure you have the charm down pat. Wendell did not answer immediately. Say, that gives me an idea, he finally declared. Why kill the giant anyway? To please the beauteous maiden, of course, said the pixie. Yes, but why kill him, questioned Wendell. Why not just change him into something good and harmless and useful? The beauteous maiden would like that just as well, wouldn't she? Well, you can ask her, said the pixie. This is the age of labor-saving. Only killing seems more definite somehow, more final. But you can ask her. I'll try to get her on the phone now, said Wendell, and you be thinking up something to change him to. And say, look in the book and find the charm for it. Wendell was gone for some time. I couldn't get her, he said when he returned, but I'm sure she'd be willing. We'll go ahead and plan something anyway. Did you find a charm? Oh, yes, loads of them, said the pixie. Just listen to these. To change a human being into a turtle. To change a human being into a butterfly. To change a human being into a stone. That might be good. To change a human being into a dragon. He is that already. Hold on, said Wendell. We don't want any of those. Find a general one to change him into any old thing. We can decide what afterwards. All right, said the pixie. I'll keep on looking and you keep on thinking. We might change him into a janitor, suggested Wendell who had been looking idly out of the window until his eye fell on the janitor of Sammy's apartment house. He's useful, you know. He puts out ashes and runs the furnace. Oh, that would never do, cried the pixie. That giant has shown he can't be trusted in any position of absolute authority and unlimited despotism. You must curtail his powers instead of enlarging them. A cook would be good, said Wendell, who really had a very practical mind. My mother and all her friends say there aren't enough cooks to go round. I told you, said the pixie wearily, you must curtail his powers. Just use your brain a little. Isn't the cook the greatest power in the household? Might as well leave him a giant and be done with it. Well, I can't think, said Wendell. I don't know anything useful. A Victrola, perhaps. I wonder if the beauteous maiden has a Victrola. I'm sure she can think of something, anyhow. Sure enough, the beauteous maiden was resourceful enough to meet the situation. She called Wendell up herself after school Monday, just as he was going to the telephone to try to get her. Of course, Wendell had not been idle over Sunday. He had made himself thoroughly familiar with all the various charms for transforming people that he could find in the book. There was one first-class charm that suited him to perfection, because it was adaptable. With this charm you could change anything to anything else, anywhere, at any time. Wendell practiced with it in a harmless sort of way, quite a little, to be sure he could work it. He changed his eraser to a bean-shooter first, and shot beans at some cats on the back fence. Then he changed a very handsome and unread copy of Macaulay's History of England that his aunt had given him into a gold watch, which, however, he was careful to keep out of sight of the family, especially Cousin Virginia. He changed an old pen wiper into a box of caramels. That was an inspiration. And in Sunday school he changed a hymnal into a mouse, 
It ran across the Sunday school room and made quite a diversion. That was one of his successes. He did another interesting thing. He changed Sammy's janitor into a crab just as he was crossing the street. That was an easy change because Sammy's janitor was something of a crab anyway. He changed him back again, though, because a street on Beacon Hill is no place for a crab. By the time he heard from the beauteous maiden, he felt quite ready to carry out any suggestions she might offer. End of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of It's Your Fairy Tale, You Know by Elizabeth Rhodes Jackson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Happy Family. I have so much to tell you, said the beauteous maiden's happy voice over the telephone. Listen, I've heard from Mummer. She phoned. My cruel stepmother, you know, only she isn't any more. She says she is entirely disenchanted, and she was perfectly lovely to me. I told her all about you, and she was so pleased. She wants to meet you, of course, but I thought it was safer to wait until you had killed the giant. Mummer says he's terribly hard to get on with, now that she's stopped being a witch. He doesn't like it a bit. When do you think you can kill him? I want to ask you about that, interrupted Wendell, and he laid his plan before her. The beauteous maiden was very enthusiastic over it. Better, she exclaimed. Oh, much better. Now, what shall he be changed to? Something useful, as you say. I thought of a Victrola, urged Wendell, who was fond of music. You haven't a Victrola, have you? And every family needs one. No, we haven't, said the beauteous maiden. That's rather good, if we can't think of anything better. But let me see. What we really need in our family, more than a Victrola even, is social placement. Background, that sort of thing, you know. Even with youth, innocence, and beauty, you do need background, too, if you know what I mean. And it's been an awfully hard thing to manage. Impossible, really, with a giant and a witch right in plain sight in the family. Now what can you change the giant to that would be most useful for background? Mayflower Society, said Wendell. Sons of the American Revolution. We have a lot of those in our family. That's what you mean, isn't it? In a way, said the beauteous maiden, but those things aren't any use unless they are handled properly. I'll tell you the kind of thing I mean. A Harvard professor, say. That would give us atmosphere as well as background. But they'd have to create a special chair for him, wouldn't they? hesitated Wendell. Why, no, said the beauteous maiden. You'll change him down small, of course. Then he can use any chair they have. Well, all right, said Wendell. I'll do it this afternoon, if you like. Oh, will you? cried the beauteous maiden. That will be simply wonderful. And we'll go out to call on them tomorrow afternoon, if you can. So it was settled. Wendell was to work the charm at once and meet the maiden at the frog pond after school next day. Of course, it was a perfectly easy thing for Wendell to do after all his practice so he was sure the charm had worked and felt entirely safe in going out to Brookline with the beauteous maiden next afternoon. She looked very charming when he met her at the frog pond. Even though not liking her general style, Wendell had to admit that she was good-looking. "'I'm making a tremendous success,' she told him. "'And listen, I have such good news for the family. I've got a job for my sister in character parts.' Isn't that fine? Poor thing, of course she could never play anything calling for youth, innocence, and beauty, but she has just the face for character parts, don't you think so? How very strange it seemed to Wendell to be alighting from the electric at the familiar corner, to be retracing his hazardous steps towards that dangerous house in perfect safety on an entirely conventional errand. He said so to the beauteous maiden, and she smiled, and answered softly, I know you ran some frightful risks for my sake. Believe me, I am not unappreciative, as time will show. Wendell wished he hadn't mentioned it. 
The neat white house was unchanged without, but the moment the beauteous maiden opened the door with her latch key and called, Mummer, I'm here, Wendell was conscious of an entire change in the mental atmosphere. The good stepmother came running out from the kitchen to meet them. Her gray hair was arranged in a recent and becoming fashion. She had had her projecting teeth out and had some new pivot teeth that looked much better, and she wore an inexpensive but tasteful afternoon frock. But the greatest change was in her sweet motherly face. She put her arms around the beauteous maiden, half laughing and half crying, called over her shoulder, "'Daughter, daughter, here's your dear sister,' and then drew her into the living room for one more kiss. The beauteous maiden, for her part, looked up at her mother with all her youth, innocence, and beauty, shining in her eyes, and said, "'Mummer, dear, you must meet my deliverer, Wendell Bradford.' I can't tell in one breath how much he has done for me, but when you know it all you will welcome him as a son, even as you welcome me as a daughter. And Wendell found himself folded in the good stepmother's embrace. He was very much alarmed, and before he could escape, he found the stepsister giving him a sisterly kiss, too. You know, he explained, in horrible embarrassment, I'm not old enough to think about marrying. He hoped this would end the matter, but the good stepmother said, I know she will wait for you, dear boy, at which Wendell writhed, but tried to hide it. Then the ex-giant came in, and such a family reunion as took place then. The present professor was a scholarly-looking man with a benignant face. He welcomed the beauteous maiden with great affection and shook Wendell's hand cordially and called him a noble fellow. The family had so much to talk about after their long separation that they hardly knew where to begin. The beauteous maiden had told her mother over the telephone all about her success in the pictures, but of course her stepsister had innumerable questions to ask her, for movie life is always fascinating to non-professionals. When the stepsister heard that the magic doors of movie land had been opened to her, too, through this excellent offer to play character parts, she almost wept for joy. "'And to think of my envy and jealousy of you, dear sister,' she said, "'and what kindness you are showing to me now in spite of it all.' "'Hush! Do not let us speak of that,' said the beauteous maiden. "'You know my youth, innocence, and beauty are equaled only by my beauty of character. Then the family plans had to be discussed. The ex-giant was very happy in his professorship, and talked enthusiastically of the courses that he was to give, and an annotated textbook that he had been asked to edit. Then there is the question of my library, he said. Have you any idea of the size of a college professor's library? Wendell said he hadn't. "'Well, I haven't either,' said the professor. "'But I've been shopping for a library this morning, "'and I talked with a very intelligent second-hand bookstore man. "'He said five feet was the standard length for a student's library, "'and he showed me several five-foot lengths "'that had been turned in to him by college students in excellent condition. "'Some of them, indeed, looked as if they had never been opened. "'I bought ten lengths.' "'Don't you think fifty feet of library should be about right for a professor "'if five feet is required for a student?' "'Wendell and the family, after some intelligent discussion of this point, agreed with him. "'Wendell was feeling quite at home with his new acquaintances by this time. "'The professor sat in a big Morris chair with the beauteous maiden on a cricket at his feet, "'while his hands strayed lovingly among her curls.' The stepsister perched with one arm around the professor's neck. On the sofa, the motherly stepmother sat beside Wendell and leaned over occasionally to pat his hand. It was altogether a charming scene of family happiness, such as is too rare, alas, in these modern days of automobiling, jazz, and summer camps. Wendell was thinking how happy they all seemed, when the stepsister suddenly said, "'You'll have me for a bridesmaid, won't you, dearest?' 
"'Of course, dear, if Wendell agrees with me,' said the beauteous maiden, smiling. Poor Wendell! With all his heart he wished that he had never become involved in his heroic role. Of course, as deliverer, he had to marry the beauteous maiden, but he did not conceal from himself the fact that he had never really fancied her. Even when she was a frog, he thought, I didn't want her around. He was thoroughly unhappy. End of chapter 16"'Chapter Seventeen of It's Your Fairy Tale, You Know, by Elizabeth Rhodes Jackson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sammy Tries His Hand. The stepsister brought him some lemonade and delicious nut cakes before they left, and Wendell felt better after he had eaten five of them. Still, he was glad when the affectionate farewells were over, and he and the beauteous maiden were once more on their way to Boston.' By chance they met on the electrics, a friend of the beauteous maidens, a moving picture friend, her leading man, in fact. He seemed very, very glad to see the beauteous maiden. After being introduced to Wendell, he sat down on the other side of the beauteous maiden and began to talk to her very low and earnestly. The beauteous maiden was evidently uncomfortable. She kept turning around and trying to include Wendell in the conversation, and she laughed a good deal at whatever the young man was saying, and tried to make light of what was apparently to him a serious matter. Now Wendell had the cap of thought in his pocket, and as he couldn't hear one word that the young man was saying, and the beauteous maiden evidently didn't wish him to be left out, he took out the magic cap and slipped it on under his own cap, as a convenience. Around him rose the confused babble of many thoughts, but to his utmost amazement, close beside him was a sound of sobbing, of heartbreaking sobbing, although the beauteous maiden was laughing gaily. And what was she thinking? Oh, my dear deliverer, I must marry you when you grow up. The deliverer always expects it, and never, never shall I let you suspect that this young man who plays my leading parts is the only man in the world for me, that I love him as maiden never loved before. No, though his heart and mine shall break, I shall uphold the traditions of all fairy tales and marry you according to the book. An old gentleman reading the paper across the aisle received a great shock at this moment. His paper was suddenly dashed from his hand by a boy's cap, which descended suddenly from above. It was Wendell's cap, not the magic one, and he had thrown it in the air with a sudden hurrah as he heard what the beauteous maiden was thinking. After he had picked up the old gentleman's paper and apologized, he pulled at the sleeve of the beauteous maiden and said, "'Listen here a minute. I heard what you thought.' "'What do you mean?' asked the maiden. "'I have on the cap of thought,' said Wendell. "'Why, so you have,' said she. "'And I wish you wouldn't feel so bad,' he went on. "'You can marry the young man just as well as not. "'I don't want you to wait for me. "'By the time I'm grown up, I may like some other girl better. "'Anyway, you just needn't consider me. "'Suit yourself entirely.' "'Do you mean that, really?' she asked. "'I certainly do,' said Wendell fervently. "'Oh, how perfectly wonderful!' she cried. And then Wendell took off his cap of thought, for her thoughts of the young man grew so enthusiastic that Wendell was rather bored by listening in. "'Well, that's well over,' he said to himself gaily, "'and I'm certainly coming out of this adventure all to the good. There's the pixie doing my fractions for me. There's the cloak of darkness and the cap of thought, whenever I want to do a little sleuthing, and there's the magic book for all-round enchantment. I certainly am in luck. At Park Street he said good-bye to the grateful, beauteous maiden and her leading man and started along Joy Street for home, with a light-heartedness that he had not known for days. He turned into his own street, and there was Sammy Davis shinnying up a street lamp. "'Hi, Sam,' he called. "'Come on over.' 
He suddenly realized that he had lost track of Sammy lately, with so many magic tasks on foot. "'Come on in, Sam,' he said. "'I've got something to show you.' Sam came in. "'It's up in my room,' said Wendell. "'Come on up.' Once there, Wendell brought out the cloak of darkness. "'Is that all?' asked Sammy. "'That's enough, I guess,' said Wendell. "'You just wait.' He threw the cloak around his shoulders. Sammy stared, open-mouthed. He gazed around the room, then started up in fright and rushed to the open window. "'Here I am!' cried Wendell, and stood there, grinning, visible once more. While Sammy still stood staring, Wendell pulled the cloak around himself again and laughed outright at Sammy's face. Then he came into sight again and asked generously, "'Want to try it yourself?' "'Of course Sammy wanted to, "'and the boys took turns being it "'in a novel kind of blind man's buff, "'which was a great deal more fun to Wendell "'than when he had played the same game with the giant. "'After that Wendell brought out the cap of thought "'and adjusted it to his head. "'Now think of something, Sammy,' he said. "'Think of what?' asked Sammy, "'his mind immediately becoming a perfect blank.' as Wendell could feel. "'Oh, say a verse,' suggested Wendell. "'That's right. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere.' "'Gee, Wendell, how do you do it?' asked Sammy in bewilderment. "'Try it again,' said Wendell. "'I get you. The breaking waves dashed high on a stern and rock-bound coast.' "'I know something,' said Sammy. "'You hold on a minute.' I got you stung this time. Sure enough, though Wendell could get the sounds perfectly, they were too unfamiliar for him to repeat. I can't say it, he explained, but I can hear it all right. It's some foreign language. I bet it's Yiddish. Yes, it is, said Sammy. Now let me try. So Wendell put the cap on Sammy's head and thought, Sammy Davis, you're a nut and Sammy grinned and enjoyed the joke on himself. "'Gee, Wendell,' said Sammy, "'you certainly are in luck. You can go anywhere and find out anything. You are a lucky dog.' "'Yes, sir,' said Wendell, "'and I'll never have to study again. I can just wear this cap in school, and when the teacher gives out a question, I'll read the answer right in his mind and say it right off. I'll do that all through school and all through college.' And then when I'm in business, I'll put on the cloak and go right into the offices of all the big businessmen, Rockefeller and Henry Ford and everybody, and wear the cap and find out just what they are thinking and how they make their money, and I'll make mine the same way. Gee, said Sammy again, and could find no further speech. And that isn't all, said Wendell. Here's the biggest thing yet. "'What is it, anyway?' demanded Sammy, looking suspiciously at the magic volume. "'A book of spells,' said Wendell impressively. "'Ha! Huh, a spelling book, eh?' echoed Sammy unenthusiastically. "'No, no,' said Wendell. "'Spells! Charms, you know, enchantments. Look here,' turning the pages. "'How to turn base metals into gold? The easiest way to disenchant a dumb princess?' some tried methods for killing giants hey let me see cried sammy some book i'll say how to place a lost ring in a fish's mouth what do you know how to locate the place where treasure is buried some book i'll tell the world say some of this don't make much sense does it abracadabra alaka balaka he spelled out a word or two a horrible odor filled the room like burnt scrambled eggs, thought Wendell. There floated before his eyes a dimness as of smoke. It took shape of an awful humanness and took color as of white ashes. It slowly took on a dull glow, which brightened until, before the boy's terrified vision, stood a horrible demon, angrily glowing a fiery red. He gave out heat like a kitchen stove on ironing day and the rug where he stood began to smoke. "'What are your commands?' he hissed. There were none. Both boys went through the door and downstairs, 
before he had finished the question. Sammy fled in terror before that frightful apparition, and Wendell went to bring Sammy back, but he didn't think of that good reason till afterwards. Neither boy paused in flight till the street was reached. Did he have hooves and a tail? gasped Sammy. They stared up at the top windows. A jet of flame shot up. The muslin window curtain was on fire. Fire! yelled Sammy, rushing down the street to the alarm box. Wendell, this to his credit, ran back into the burning house and alarmed the family. Mrs. Bradford rushed for her jewels. Cousin Virginia, with great presence of mind, put in a fire call by telephone. Sammy's alarm had already reached the fire station on Mount Vernon Street. Almost as Virginia left the telephone, the clang of engines was heard, and a line of firemen carrying the hose upstairs with their formula. Is everybody out? The servants rushed, clamoring to the street. Virginia ran to help and reassure Mrs. Bradford, and Wendell followed the last fireman up to his room. The smoke was so dense that at first he could see nothing. Then he saw that the stream of chemical had extinguished all the flames, and was now directed at a fiery pillar in a sort of human shape that glowed redly through the smoke. Wendell alone knew what it was. Little by little the angry glow faded to white ashes. Gradually it dimmed to floating smoke. The fire was out. The smoke cleared. The firemen withdrew. The family assembled to view the blackened walls, to sniff the depressing odor as of a burnt-out district, to exclaim over the havoc and ruin wrought in those few minutes. "'How did it happen?' everyone asked. And, "'I don't know,' said Wendell helplessly. "'How could he explain?' "'Wasn't that Sammy Davis in here?' asked the cook. "'You two boys were up to something, I know.' His pretty room was a thing of the past, completely burnt out. The walls were black. A few charred rags had once been window curtains. A sodden rag underfoot was his rug. The closet was burned through. Blackened shreds of garments hung on the nails. Wendell's desk was but charred timbers. His books were paper ashes. "'I know why Wendell looks so woe-begone,' said Cousin Virginia. His school books are burned. Don't worry, dear, said his mother. Everything is covered by insurance. You wanted your room redecorated, you know, and it is easy to replace the clothes and books. Ah, yes, but who could replace the cloak of darkness? Who could restore the cap of thought? What insurance would cover the book of spells? Wendell was doomed once more to the drudgery of other mortals to learning his lessons like other boys, to plodding his toilsome way through college, to making his own business success unaided by the great minds of the world's financiers. No wonder he stood there glum and almost tearful amid the blackened ruins of his room and of his future. Then suddenly, as he stood by the window, his eyes fell upon the street below, and the crowd of neighbor boys still lingering about the scene of the fire and upon the stone post that stood at the entrance to the court over the way, and his eyes brightened to something like happy anticipation as he said under his breath, Well, anyway, I have one wish left on the wishing stone. End of chapter 17 End of It's Your Fairy Tale, You Know by Elizabeth Rhodes Jackson